Greetings, everyone. My name is Dr. Jamila Mahmoud, and I'm speaking to you from Malaysia. It is a real privilege for me to be able to deliver an address, a keynote address to share my experiences on partnerships, particularly private and public partnerships in the field of humanitarian crisis. We know that the use of mobile technology has grown exponentially across the world. Even in my country of 32 million people, the number of mobile phone um, users has been registered to be beyond 43 million. This is not uncommon in this part of the world, but also we have seen in many other parts of the world, higher numbers, uh, which, which implies that more than one device is often used by one person. The cell phone itself has become really quite a game changer in terms of communication. Anything that is in the size that fits the size of your palm is now seen to be the most efficient way of us getting information, for dis disseminating information, for connecting, for assessing knowledge, and or even things like delivery of cash. So let me start by giving you a couple of examples from the COVID-19 crisis in Malaysia itself. When the early days of the COVID-19 cases rising in Malaysia, the government was very challenged in trying to get enough PPEs and ventilators and other equipment uh, to be prepared for a further rise and to deal with the crisis itself. It was the government-led corporations and also private sector companies that came together to look at how collectively they could procure at very competitive rates, but also using their CSR and philanthropy budgets to be able to support this. As a result, the supplies of ventilators, PPEs and other requirements was very rapidly replenished and kept on standby. The government hospitals could work efficiently. Civil society organizations could also get onto the ground and deliver some PPEs, but also food and other necessities. As a result of this success, we went a step further. We got the private sector to build a platform that we have called Kita Match, or the Malaysian Coordination and Action Hub platform, where not only donors can contribute and see their contributions tracked by location, by postcode, NGOs and civil societies or government agencies that were delivering assistance could locate where these went and to whom. And more importantly, it built a lot of mutual trust in actually sharing data, but also an accountability tool in showing where these items and where this funding went. I think that this has been quite a, a, a unique uh, experience. Uh, I certainly, in my many years in the humanitarian sector, have not seen this level of private-public partnership where it comes to data management, transparency, and accountability. It was also a fantastic way for us to be able to see which were the underserved areas and therefore signaling to the different agencies, whether government or civil society, where needs were unmet. During this COVID pandemic, there was disruption in schools uh, and education due to movement restrictions. In many parts of Malaysia, children are able to access um, digital education classes through Zoom and other platforms, but in some areas it was very difficult. However, in the poorer communities, the most difficult task was actually trying to share a mobile device. As a result, the government has then established a fund, a significant fund, but partnered with a private sector foundation 
to help manage and procure and distribute digital devices so that children will no longer have disruptions in education. And I believe this is the trend in the near future. We know this is not going to be the last pandemic, but we also know we need to upgrade our services so that internet penetration is available even in the most remote parts of Malaysia. In other humanitarian crises, in my previous roles in the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, our national societies have worked very closely with the private sector in order to look at technology use, not only in terms of delivering information, for example, through Facebook or through Viber, or even TikTok, to be able to then advocate for, communicate and get people to understand what the realities and the facts are and to dispel misinformation as well. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, WhatsApp messaging, uh, SMS were all utilized during the Ebola crisis in the north where we could not only provide information to people or communities that were affected, but also collect you know, rumors and also um, address them by educating the communities that they had to come forward to bring the ones who were ill to the treatment centers rather than being suspicious and not attending these centers until it was very late. With the vaccine delivery that is now happening around the world, Malaysia has also started to look at the use of blockchain for managing, monitoring, uh, and also data storage uh, of people who will be receiving the vaccines and, and the logistics as well. So I think this is going to be the trend in the future uh, because data protection is key and being able to connect and store knowledge and information will be key, in particular to recall second doses or to check upon patients and so forth. The use of apps or application devices on smartphones, in my country, we use something called MySujatra, where we are not only able to use this as a tracking and contact tracing device, but also provide information, um, check on people who are unwell, but also in future store authentication of vaccines that they have received. So we have a lot to do in the future that will have to help us deal with disruption. And I believe technology is going to be the key to how we address our challenges. So with that, I want to thank everyone for your kind attention. I wish you all a very successful conference and I hope that we will have an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face conference in the years to come. Thank you very much.